Now, a special presentation from 12 News. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Diverse Discussions. Over the next half hour, we'll examine what's become the most populous and diverse generation in our history, Gen Z. Hello, I'm Adriana Rosas Rivera. And I'm Shannon Heggie. Our panel tonight will weigh in on a variety of issues, including how this generation can live, thrive, and make an impact here in Rhode Island. So let's introduce you to them. Tonight, we're joined by, by Greg Almeida, founder and CEO of Global View Communications, Generation Z expert via Valenti, who specializes on supporting diversity and equity initiatives and Gen Z strategy, and editor-in-chief of the Anchor newspaper at Rhode Island College and member of Gen Z, Raymond Bakari. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank Thanks you for having, having us. us. All right, so let's get right into it. What is Gen Z? We'll be putting up the definition on your screen for those who don't know, and many really don't know what Gen Z is, who makes up Generation Z. So Greg, why don't we start with you to kind of answer that question for yeah, us? So it's everybody that's between the ages of 16 and 25, 25 years old. Um, Gen Z is, uh, just from a statistical standpoint, um, the, probably the most diverse generation that we've seen in this country's history. Um, they were born in between 1997 and 2013. And one of the things to think about in, that, in, that, in those years are some of the milestones that have happened in this country that really sort of formulate um, their experience and how they feel um, about uh, institutions in the, in the country and what needs to change. So Via, in terms of Gen Z, what is the racial and ethnic makeup of the local population here? Yeah, so, you know, Rhode Island has a large college age population, but they have a really diverse uh, group of college students as well. And so, um, you know, I think a call out is that just under 20% of Rhode Island's population um, is Hispanic. And I think that um, when thinking about how we can engage Gen Z, thinking about um, and thinking about the diversity in the population, I think it's important that we think of innovative ways to get Gen Z involved in the community and um, in their workplace as well. Do we know what can influence that racial and, and ethnic uh, breakup within the population at all? Uh, what can influence it? I think uh, community impact and, uh, you know, Gen Z is pushing, one of the things that Gen Z is pushing for is, um, you know, boundaries within their workplace and, and, and their community involvement as well. Um, so uh, finding ways that they can be empowered to um, contribute to the local community. Kind of playing off what Via just said, Raymond, what matters to Gen Z? We've obviously seen that they're very vocal. What are the topics that, that they're most passionate about? Yeah, uh, there's quite a number of issues that are uh, very much so on Gen Z's mind as we're seeing in recent election cycles such as 2018, 2020, and the most recent midterm election, 2022, where Gen Z was really influential on that national election result that we've seen in the House and Senate races. In terms of uh, political issues that are on their minds, um, LGBTQ plus rights, addressing gun violence, protecting the environment, uh, uh, ensuring that a woman has a right to choose, the whole nine yards. So a recent study by Scholaru, a nonprofit educational research company and scholarship website engine, said Rhode Island is ranked number nine when it comes to the states that Gen Z can thrive in and number one for best quality of life. So Via, why do you think that is and what are other states lacking? Yeah, so I, I think for Rhode Island, again, um, going back to the diverse college population here, I think the challenge for Rhode Island is going to be how do you retain mm -hmm. that talent within the state, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we have to start thinking about how we can shift attitudes to prioritizing the needs of young people, like I said, in the communities, in their workplaces, and at school. And, um, you know, that includes thinking about issues that are important to them, like flexibility, remote work, um, social activism. And I think Rhode Island um, you know, needs to start prioritizing that um, with opportunities in the state. Now, there seems to be maybe a perception that there's a mistrust or a lack of trust between Gen Z and law enforcement. A, do you think that that perception is correct? And B, what needs to be done about it? And, and any of you can take this question. So, so, so you know, mistrust is an interesting word. I I would flip that and I would say that there's a different expectation that Gen Z has around law enforcement. I think that uh, the older you are in this country, um, you probably have a little bit more of a, a traditional definition of what law enforcement's role is. 
Um, I think that what we've seen over the last few years with George Floyd, um, Breonna Taylor, and others is that, and, and some of the mental health issues that, that Via had mentioned, I think there's a different expectation of what law enforcement is there to do. Mm. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say there's mistrust, although I'm sure that in some segments of the Gen Z population, whether it's age, whether it's race, whether mm. it's geography, uh, there may be some mistrust in there, but but again, I think it's more what, what what expectations, what the expectations are. Now we've seen police departments. I know Providence Police have talked about it specifically, getting more um, community involvement and community policing. Via, do you think that's a way to kind of repair that relationship with Gen Z and make sure that both sides of the equation here uh, trust each other? Yeah, and, and I'd have to, uh, you know, bounce off what Greg said. I think uh, law enforcement being visible in the community is a way to bridge that gap with Gen Z. I think that, you know, there is mistrust, but I think um, confusion about how law enforcement plays a role in the community and being more visible and being more active so Gen Z can actually see um, how law enforcement shows up is a big part of that. Absolutely. I mean, especially speaking of when I was in school as a kid, you know, you had DARE officers, you had law enforcement officers, and school so your first impression was of an officer you trusted Raymond do you think that it's getting police back into schools community programs after school programs things like that yeah absolutely community policing is a big policy goal especially we're seeing be more in the spotlight in Providence uh, the current mayor Brett Smiley he campaigned on that mm -hmm. when the conversation around public safety had emerged and also maybe even going further with social media we uh, we were talking about before we got in the studio TikTok's a very uh, big source that Gen Z uses to get most of their news and information. So really quickly, uh, Ray, what do you think about the trust in the press, right? What's been your experience <laughs> covering Gen Z? Uh, it's been very interesting. First off, it's a very active and vocal generation. And kind of going off what I was saying in the previous answer, TikTok, uh, uh, other platforms like Snapchat and Instagram are definitely where a lot of the generation is getting their news source from. They're kind of shying away from the traditional mm -hmm. news mediums such as television, radio, and print. Uh, as the editor-in-chief of my local college paper at Rhode Island College called The Anchor, we notice we get a big amount of traction on Instagram, for example. Yeah, we've changed, I know, our own approach to news mm -hmm. uh, for Gen Z, and it keeps evolving, so they're changing so much. And now they're saying they don't want to watch TV? I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> we'll work with them. We'll work with them. Well, we're just getting started on diverse discussions. When we come back, how Generation Z is getting involved in political and cultural causes. Welcome back to Diverse Discussions, a special presentation from 12 News. We're talking with local community members and experts about Generation Z and how they're making an impact in Rhode Island. Generation Z is very involved in many causes and politics. Here at home, we're seeing a diverse slate of candidates running for the congressional seat being vacated by David Cicilline. And when it comes to political participation, how are candidates engaging younger voters? Via, this one's for you. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, you know, we're living in an interesting time where young people, you know, they, they're not really resonating with, you know, traditional political institutions and also traditional political outreach. And I think the best advice I have to candidates in Rhode Island and nationally is to meet Gen Z where they are. Mm -hmm. We know that Gen Z is getting a, a lot of their news um, from TikTok and YouTube and short form video platforms. And we saw in 2020 and 2022, um, voters under 30 highly favored politicians who met them on those pla on those platforms and got name recognition and talk about to talk about important issues to Gen Z. And when you say traditional outreach, can you just tell viewers what that means? You know, uh, like Ray mentioned, you know, traditional news channels on TV, reading newspapers, they're looking for uh, more accessible and digestible digestible information, and that's why they're turning to those platforms like TikTok and YouTube. Does canvassing also fall under that? Uh, posters, signage. Have you guys seen that that's not as appealing? I don't think it's as appealing. I think it can be effective in, an ad in addition to, um, but the, the primary places that Gen Z is going to, going to get information is on social media. You know, with political engagement believed to be strong, why do we see actual turnout when it comes to the polls for Gen Z uh, lacking in Rhode Island? Raymond? That's an interesting discussion to have because I was surprised when I uh, first saw that statistic. I think definitely having more organizations uh, definitely reaching out would help. For example, we see national ones like uh, Voters of Tomorrow, 
Pro, mm -hmm. Gen Z for Change, mm -hmm. on the left uh, end of the political spectrum, and even on the right side, Turning Point USA and um, Run Gen Z, for example, that have those Gen Z candidates run. So definitely outreach. We're also seeing it kind of start where we're seeing Gen Zers get elected to local office, such mm -hmm. as State Representative David Morales, youngest ever elected member of the Rhode Island House of Representatives. He's a Gen Zer um, in my house district, House 9, located in Providence. Uh, State Rep Enrique Sanchez, he's a Gen Zer. His brother, Miguel Sanchez, also a Gen Zer, just got elected to the City Council in Ward 6. So we're seeing it starting. Uh, there's only, uh, you can only go higher from here. Do you think that um, voters are just more excited and that's why they follow those candidates or excited to see people from their own generation to People connect like with. Them, yeah. Definitely, yeah. Rep Morales is very charismatic. Just aside from being in politics, he's also involved with the local wrestling promotions and always, uh, you know, having community town halls. That definitely helps. Um, also, a lot of these, uh, the younger representatives also use so social media, like we were talking about. TikTok's a, a big platform. Even in Congress, we're seeing uh, Rep, I believe, Jeff Jackson from North Carolina. He's big on TikTok. So that definitely the engagement of social media helps. Do so you Brett, find that it's, I'm sorry, Adriana, do you find that it's less about party affiliation too? Because I feel like the younger generation is kind of sick of the Democrat or Republican. They care more about what are your issues. We don't right. want Absolutely. this partisan yeah. politics yeah. thing. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I, I think it's, I, I don't, I think Gen Z can be ruthless about loyalty and that goes for beyond politics, but brand loyalty, company loyalty, you know, they hold their values true and, um, you know, they stand firm in those values. And one of them, um, like Ray mentioned, is representation and they are um, looking for representation Representatives to reflect those values, and um, they're going to be empowered by uh, uh, representatives who uh, talk about those values mm -hmm. rather than a political affiliation that you just expect to support those things. Exactly. And Shannon, you actually brought up something along the same lines of what I was going to ask Greg. So Gen Z is involved in so many different causes from Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. to LGBTQ issues, homelessness. So Greg, how do you think that they're making their voices heard? Well, just the other day, um, and, and while we're doing this program, um, there was a young man that was shot in Kansas City um, ringing, a, ringing a doorbell. Um, the school that he went to, uh, the students walked out. Mm. Um, over 1,500 students walked out in protest. Um, there's obviously uh, been uh, protests around gun violence um, and other issues. So. Traditionally in this country, because we've all been Gen Z, no matter what, <laughs> we would just call something else. No matter you know uh, what generation we're from, we were all youth at one point, and we all were advocates and et cetera. I mean, I think typically the youth vote in this country has been uh, lower than other age ranges, but I think that that's changing because of the way Gen Z shares information and, the, and, the, and how rapid that information gets out. The thing to remember about Gen Z is about uh, a third of them are between the ages of 16 and 18. And you can't vote until you turn 18. Right. Um, but um, what's going to be interesting in terms of the institutions, the political institutions in this country, is the activism that they will already have embedded in them by the time they're able to vote. So they will have already chosen issues. Issues will not be chosen for them. Um, they will already uh, be aware of their power in terms of their voice, et cetera, um, instead of being way, to told, uh, uh, being way to told to speak. So I just think that um, the, the, the question for a lot of institutions, and Via mentioned this in terms of workplace and culture, is not are we ready, are, are, are they ready for us, it's are we ready for them. Yeah, going off of that, Greg, how do you think Gen Z, whether it comes to politics or workplace, how are they looking to change Rhode Island. We talked about the large college population here. What do they want to see change? So I know Rhode Island is always trying to get college students to stay. Right. What are they trying to do? And any of you can answer this uh, to to make the state what they want to see. How are they changing the landscape of Rhode Island? Well, right the now? big barometer in terms of retention, it doesn't matter what um, um, uh, gender, race, or age you're talking about is culture. And culture can be defined in a bunch of different ways. But um, for me, when I think about culture, it's do I belong? And um, do I feel like I belong? And do I feel like I have activities and educational opportunities and job opportunities uh, to be involved in where I can grow and thrive? That's the big barometer, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. So 
um, Gen Z is basically, they're either going to demand that changes are made or they're going to leave. And that's why we see that outflow in a lot of cities. Boston has struggled with that mightily, retaining their college population. Um, not so much here, because I think that we take culture a little bit more seriously here, um, and we're able to retain those students. All right, so when Diverse Discussions continues, we'll examine the impacts Gen Z have made on the workforce and how employers can reach this crucial group. Stay with us. Welcome back to Diverse Discussions, a special presentation from 12 News. In our final segment, our conversation concludes with a look at Rhode Island's workforce and the impact Gen Z is having and can have on the changing face of companies. And right now, Rhode Island ranks number seven for growth for Gen Z. When it comes to the workforce, what are employers doing? I know Greg in our last segment was talking about the workforce needing to meet Gen Z at what they want. Via, what specifically is that? What do Gen Zers want from their employers? Yeah, and you know, I think it comes down to previous generations really uh, live to work and mm -hmm. Gen Z is working to live. And that means setting boundaries in the workplace about having work-life balance, flexibility with remote work. And you know, I think that our companies have been wary to embrace Gen Z, but I really think calling them in and recognizing that generational knowledge actually goes both ways, right? There's uh, knowledge from previous generations, but if you include Gen Z and give them a seat at the table, um, what kind of innovation can they bring to your company? Via, do you think that attitude has changed because of COVID or has Gen Z always been sort of in that mindset of really appreciating mm -hmm. life outside the workplace? Yeah, it's funny because, you know, when I graduated from college or when I started college, I thought that I was going to be in office five days a week. I thought that, you know, if I went to when I went to grad school that I was going to be going to school in person. But uh, that all shifted. And I think when Gen Z got a taste of the work-life balance that they didn't anticipate, they, they wanted more of it. And so um, they're expecting more of their employers um, in terms of those benefits. So as we've mentioned earlier, Gen Z is made up of various racial and ethnic backgrounds. So how do you think they're pushing for diversity in the workforce? And actually, Raymond, I'll throw this to you. What are you seeing in terms of newsrooms and just in media in general? Definitely a prioritization of inclus inclusivity in all aspects. Uh, you know, there's a lot of marginalized communities that are now inclusivity is becoming more of a priority for not only companies, but also speaking of Gen Z, this generation is just more inclusive and more progressive in all regards. On the workforce topic, I was thinking about this, especially when we were talking about retaining these uh, young folks after they graduate from college. Housing and mental the mental health crisis are two big issues on the minds of Gen Zers. It's, we're in a housing crisis right now, so it's hard to find housing after you graduate and then rent's very expensive and then the mental health crisis uh, we've seen recent legislative efforts uh, two bills signed last year to try to address that shortage in mental health counselors so those are also two issues it goes even beyond um, you know just the workforce retaining them is a big part too you have an, that, that's an interesting question in terms of um, what is Gen Z sort of demanding so he, here's the way I sort of look at this right every institution organization in this country has a set of core values which are the behaviors that they, ex that, that they say that the organization lives by. Um, I think that for many generations before Gen Z, we kind of just went along, got along, uh, went along to get along. Gen Z is actually demanding that companies be who they say they are um, through their core values. And, and they're very aware um, of the power that they have um, to leave. Mm. Um, if an organization is not living up to their core values, is not uh, their their actions aren't aligned with their words, uh, Gen Z will call them out. Yeah, I, I think off of that, um, a value that Gen Z holds is authenticity and transparency. Yep. And so, like Greg is saying, if you're not a lot, if you're saying that um, you know you value DE and I, and we know that 80% of Gen Z has indicated that a significant um, value that they hold for organizations is DE and I, and they're willing to switch employers if their uh, the actions of their employers don't align with the words that they say about DE and I. So, um, being authentic and actually showing your values within your workplace and changing workplace culture is something Gen Z cares about. Climate too. Yeah. Climate's the other big issue. Yeah. That, it's that it's fascinating are, yeah. to think about 
you know, back again, just I, I, keep, I can't help but compare millennials and Gen Z, right? right? And I think right. everybody does. But millennials, when they got into the workforce, and we were talking about this earlier, were in a recession. So you took whatever job right. you could get. Now we have a worker shortage, and Gen Z is in a position to really take this um, – the way that they are, you know, wanting things and changing things and, and take that into the workplace as well. Yeah, absolutely. And how did, you mentioned climate real, just very quickly. Why do you think climate is, climate is so important to the generation? Because they're the ones that are going to inherit the planet. Mm. I mean, I, I, sometimes I think some of these topics get more complicated than they need to be. I think at the end of the day, um, you know, Gen Z is aware that they're going to be around a lot longer than I am. Um, and, and the reality is, what is the, what is the, what is the state of the planet going to be um, in 30 or 40 years? Because they're the ones that are going to be in the midst of that. But all the polling shows that the two big issues, including uh, three big issues, including politics for Gen Z, climate, DE&I, in the political the political system in our country. Well, let me jump in, Greg. We want to thank all of our guests for joining us tonight for these very important conversations. And you can see these topics and more uh, in our past diverse discussions on WPRI.com. Have a great night. Thank you for watching.